Nice to be with you all today. Uh, my name is James, and it is great to be gathering in person and online, online as a church. Now, I'm not sure how you slept last night. I'm not sure if it was muggy and uncomfortable, but uh, we come today to gather around the God of all comfort and joy. So let me pray for us uh, as we come before Him. Heavenly Father, we thank You for who You are, that You are a God who stays the same, that you don't change, and that you love us and you care for us, and you welcome us into your family. Be with us this morning. Help us to have attentive ears, to hear from you and to have our lives changed, to grow more and more like your Son. We ask this in His name and for your glory. Amen. Let's stand and worship our great God together.
just all take myself and I will be ever only all for thee take myself and I will be ever only all for thee blessed us in so many ways, but we see your love and blessing to us most in Jesus. And we thank you for him today, that he lived, that he died and he rose to make us clean before you, to forgive us, to remove our shame and to bring us into your family. Amen. Please grab a seat. 
It is great to see you all today and to be seen by those who are unable to be here and watching at home. Uh, we would love to have you here at person, but it's great that we can do this until that time. Uh, my name is James, and I'm really thankful uh, that we are here to worship God together as a diverse group of people, those who know Jesus and those who are getting to know Him. Now, we are just charging towards the end of 2020. We are you're just rocketing towards Christmas. It's moments away. And whilst it has been a strange year, it has also been a good year for reflection. Do I really need to work at the office? Do I really need to commute if I can just work at home? Do I really need to send my kids to school or can I just teach them at home? No, no, we need that one. Definitely need that. Do I really need to go to university to study? I can study at home. Invariably, maybe you just stay in bed. You know, do I really miss people? Do I really need to see people? And yes, again, reflection, I miss, I miss spending time with people. We've also been a church reflecting on who we are and who God is making us to be. Who God is making us to be as his disciples following him, seeking to grow in Christ's likeness, being saturated in his word, delighting to read his word daily, spending time with him, growing in his likeness. That is who we want to be here as a church at St. Paul's. And we've got a video of a couple of people reflecting on their journey here at St. Paul's and who God is making them to be. So please uh, watch the screen. Hi, I'm Gary Jones. Um, I started coming to St. Paul's Church, part of the church family here since January 2015. Since then, I've been involved in the music team um, you would have seen me on the platform from time to time and I, I love doing that, I love singing. The other main thing I'm involved with at the moment is community groups. I've found tremendous benefit but also being able to use some of my gifts uh, in, uh, in my involvement with community groups and uh, being able to get alongside people, being able to share life together. Hi, my name's Mark uh, and I became a Christian here at St Paul's over 20 years ago. Reflecting on the last uh, 10 years of um, the Vision Series, uh, I've been involved in numerous things, um, numerous ministries here, uh, including being on parish council uh, and uh, more recently a community group leader. I suppose the main thing that has really attracted me to St Paul's was the centrality of the Gospel. I, uh, some years ago now in a previous church we had a pastor who was very, very strong with his focus on the gospel, which opened my eyes to the need, the importance of that. And so <clears throat> when I came across that here at St Paul's, I was, I was thrilled. I've been really encouraged by the core values, um, particularly uh, things like uh, Christ-centered Bible saturation. Uh, I think it's really vital that we have um, great training for all the people here to be grounded in their faith. Uh, and uh, community groups have been a really key area for that. Um, not just for um, the people here, but for myself as well. Uh, and even in leading, uh, it's been great to learn from others uh, and um, be encouraged by them and just being meeting together uh, to be praying for one another and caring for one another. I've appreciated the training that we've received, um, the, the way that we've been led um, from, the, from the ministry team uh, and it's really uh, continued to uh, strengthen my faith and uh, keep me grounded in Jesus. God has been working in my life in a number of different ways, but I want to mention just two of them over the last few years. Firstly, he's, he's given me a much greater understanding, a deeper understanding and appreciation um, for his love. God loves me, he cares for me, he has my best interests at heart. He's for me, he's not against me. Um, and also he has a purpose and a plan for my life. The second main thing that God has taught me in recent times is the sovereignty of God. The fact that God is in control no matter what happens, no matter what's happening in my life, no matter what's happening in this crazy world. That's given me a better perspective, I think, on the Christian life because it's so easy to get caught up, to start thinking in terms of our own problems, our own struggles and get caught up in that, uh, but not not thinking of the big picture, um, the fact that God is still in control and God knows the big picture and he's working out his purposes. 
I'm constantly challenged in my faith um, and thinking about uh, local and global mission, uh, hearing from our missionaries overseas uh, and how we can support them. Um, uh, and even on our front lines, uh, I teach and so it's really important for me to uh, be able to share my faith with uh, younger people, um, with students, um, and I'm constantly uh, encouraged and challenged um, to do that uh, in my day-to-day -day, uh, work um, and always just being representing Jesus. My heart's desire um, for, for St Paul, for me and for St Paul's, is for all of us to be able to grow more in Christ um, and to become more and more aware of what he has done for us, his love for us, his care for us, um, so that his love will overflow through us to other people. We will be willing to look on other people with the same sort of compassion that Jesus had when he was on earth um, and to be able to reach out, to be willing to reach out and help people at their point of need just as Jesus did. Let's thank uh, Gary and Mark for sharing. It's, uh, it's really wonderful seeing what God is doing in people's lives here in Chatswood. But God is also working across our world. Uh, this month we have a, a special mission focus on supporting Darian and Vanessa and their son Benjamin uh, Klensos. Uh, and they're, they're currently serving in South Africa. They left us in 2007, and they've been over in different parts of Africa for the last 13 years. Now, back when I was uh, studying at Moore College many years ago, missionary agencies would come in, and I was always, always get so excited by the different options. Oh, I could serve with this one. Oh, I could do that. And my heart was always flip-flopping, wanting to do all of the things. But uh, we as a church... We as individuals, we can't do everything. But God doesn't want us all to be missionaries in South Africa. Uh, he doesn't even want us all to be here in Chatswood and Willoughby in the surrounding suburbs. The church is a body. He has given us different gifts and different places to serve. And so while we are here, we serve. But he might also be calling you to serve somewhere else. But before that happens, we can continue to support Darian and Vanessa as they do their very important work in South Africa, seeing millions of lives get impacted by the training of pastors. Uh, at this point, uh, we have been raising money all of November, and if you hadn't realized, November is coming very quickly to an end. We have only hours left in November, and we are seeking to raise $10,000, and we are well over halfway there. Last time I checked, it was about 5500 and this is the last week to give. We are raising money so that Darian and Vanessa have money for food and accommodation so that they can be doing the important work of training pastors to impact millions of people's lives across Africa. Uh, the details are on the screen. Let me encourage you to take up this call that while we are here and they are there, we give out of all of the wonderful gifts that God has given us. This is an opportunity we have right now to be supporting them in their work. We also continue to support the ministry here at Chatswood. Uh, you can give in two different ways. There is a box on the Connect desk, and you can also give uh, through the details on the screen. And if you do end up, end up going to the Connect desk to give cash, you can also uh, connect, you can find out more, uh, and uh, you, can, you can ask any questions that you have. Uh, let's welcome up Steve as he comes up now. Let's welcome Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Uh, I've really enjoyed uh, going through this series and just hearing the little video connections with people and telling their stories of what the last you know, 10, 11 years has been like for them. Uh, that's been a huge encouragement. And we heard from Andrew and Judy Smith recently. And so I'm going to get Andrew and Judy, if you can come on up, uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, as you would know, we are drawing to a close... Uh, Vision 2020, and one of the things that's particularly encouraged me as listening to the videos is the number of people who have connected, uh, for instance, core values uh, with change in their life and how it shaped us as a culture, as a church. 
Uh, one of the core values uh, is servant leadership. Uh, it's on the board, just on past here, the other side of this wall. You can read them all there. Uh, servant leadership, uh, really uh, part of the culture of this church is that we are not, uh, our mission is not advanced by the gifts and the skills of just a few people that we employ to do certain things, uh, but in fact by everyone uh, utilising the gifts and skills that God has given them, uh, the passion that God has given them to see uh, people one for Christ and grown up in him. Uh, and two people, Andrew and Judy, have, have been exemplary in that in the last 11 uh, years of Vision 2020, and I'm very grateful for them. Uh, and it's also with somewhat ironic, as we look forward to the next stage of life together, that this is also the time where Andrew and Judy are moving uh, to a new church. They are actually have already relocated to Orange, uh, some months ago, in fact, uh, and have keep coming back here to do music and to contribute midweek and things like that. And if you don't know where Orange is, uh, Google it after church. It's a long way away. It's too far to commute for church. Uh, so they, they, they've given us to the end of this year as a transition out to start their new church. We're grateful they've got a new church. They're committed, even in this year of COVID-19, they're connected to a new group. Uh, they're already as a small group and have already sort of straddling the process. But I just, uh, we just want to say thank you uh, to you both. Uh, they have been, as I said, exemplary as servant leaders, as contributors uh, to Vision 2020 in so many different ways. Uh, many of you who have got children will be very familiar with Judy and her uh, work constantly with our young people. Nat and I are very grateful for Judy uh, for praying for us uh, as a family, and Judy and Marilla have also contributed regularly to pray with me personally about what's going on. So being prayer partners in that, being a huge support and encouragement in that regard. Andrew has had a whole range of, of, of roles. We see him Sunday by Sunday playing guitar. Um, that's one of his passions. Um, but he's also contributed as a, as a warden, as a, as a parish councillor, as a treasurer, uh, driving the, the building project we had here back in 2014, working the last year or so on strategic uh, planning stuff with me. Uh, so we, just, we are just so grateful for you both. And uh, our loss is certainly Orange's gain, without a doubt. Um, and I just want you to uh, just put your hands together and just express gratitude uh, to them both. I'm going, to pray. I'm going to pray for them before they, they launch off. Uh, gracious God, we just uh, thank you for the, the multitude of people that, who are in your kingdom, who you bring across our paths, and you use to sharpen us. And we thank you for Andrew and Judy and the way that they have been rock solid in their support of Vision 2020 for this church, St. Paul's, uh, for us as a leadership team, uh, for me personally, uh, Lord, we are grateful for their contribution over these years uh, in building St. Paul's to what it is in a whole facet of ministries. Thank you for their wisdom and their wise counsel that they've brought to bear. Uh, thank you, Lord, for their, um, their growth in you over that time as well and the way that they have sharpened us to grow. Uh, Lord, we pray for your blessings upon them as they move and relocate to a new church family in Orange. I pray that they would know and be known uh, by a new church community. They would settle in quickly and see avenues where they can serve you in this next stage of their life. Lord, we're grateful for them and we hand them to you and pray that you would bless them abundantly in their new home in Orange. Amen. Thank you. Yes, today is the last time I get to play with Andy up front as part of the music team here. It's been a real pleasure, mate. Um, I, I'm Nick Freestone. I'm magnif Magnification Pastor here at St. Paul's. Welcome. Uh, I want to encourage you to come to prayer gathering this afternoon. The reason I want to do that uh, is because prayer, as we've just prayed, um, is speaking to God. And it's incredibly important for those who follow Jesus. Now, those who follow Jesus listening right now, I want to ask you a question. How much is prayer a part of your life? Just think about it. Think about your week. Think about your day. 
How much is prayer a part of your life? Do you want to grow in your prayer life? Do you want to be nearer to God? Do you want to speak to Him more honestly? Do you want to hear from Him through all the noise in your life? Well, as well as praying together at prayer gathering this afternoon, and as well as praying about our our future as a church and praising God with our prayers while we're socially distanced in the building uh, or online, we're also going to discover a gift from God. Uh, We're going to talk about fasting. This gift is from God to help us grow and deepen our prayer life. So come and hear what fasting is for you as a follower of Jesus. And come and grow in your prayer life. I'll see you there. But why don't we uh, kick off prayer gathering right now and pray. Almighty God, merciful Father, thank you for giving us access to your ear, your heart, and your presence when we pray. We never want to take it for granted. Help us to make the most of our access to you. And right now, Father, hear our prayer. Just as we pause, Father, we bring to you the cry of our heart right now in this silence. Father, we thank you that you are listening and that sometimes when we don't know what to say, you hear our heart. And when our heart and mind cry out, you know what we feel, where we have been and where we are going. You are with us and you are listening. Father, as we together listen and hear to all you have to reveal to us today in your word, may you stir us to a life of praise that overflows from our lips to our choices, in our works and in our plans. Help us to serve you in holiness and righteousness all our days through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom and with you and the Holy Spirit be honour and glory now and forevermore. Amen. Uh, Why don't you open your Bibles right now to Revelation? You know, grab your Bible, uh, if it's your phone, uh, make sure it's on silent or in flight mode. Grab your Bible, open to the book of Revelation. We're going to be reading from Revelation chapter 17 uh, before continuing in Revelation chapter 19. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. With her the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names. And had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Then the angel said to me, Why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and ten horns. 
turning over to chapter 19. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven, shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who was seated on the throne. And they cried, Amen! Hallelujah! Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linens bright and clean was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. At this, I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. I read uh, the story recently of a a butler who served for a number of years in the grand 17th century uh, Belton House in Lincolnshire in England. Uh, As part of his duties, he regularly dusted, in fact, I think he dusted daily and he polished pretty regularly, a World War II bomb that had been dropped on the grounds of Belton House uh, by German bombers. Uh, One day, uh, while polishing this thing, he actually managed to even uh, knock it over and and it fell on his foot while he was cleaning it, so it caused him a great deal of damage. Anyway, one Easter weekend, something like 24 years after it was put on display at the house, an army officer was visiting uh, Belton House and uh, this officer noticed to his horror that this bomb was in fact still live and was capable of levelling the entire estate. Um, The place was evacuated, as you can imagine, and the uh, Royal Air Force bomb disposal unit was called in and the bomb was disposed of. But imagine discovering that uh, you've been cleaning this thing with chemicals for 24 years, uh, polishing a live bomb, that, and you've even dropped this thing on your foot. And at any point, this thing could have exploded. Uh, It's possible to live with danger and to be totally unaware of it. In fact, we can even convince ourselves that we are indestructible, that things will go on as they are forever. The, The number of people that I've dealt with as a pastor over the years who even in their senior years still assume that they are indestructible. And it takes an expert analysis, a medical specialist, or an apocalypse to persuade us of an alternative view. Now, apocalypse is a Greek word which means revelation. It means unveiling of things that were not previously known and which cannot be known unless they are unveiled to us. And that's what the book of Revelation is. Uh, This book is not given to us to satisfy our curiosity about, you know, events in the future. It is given to open our eyes, to prod us to come awake to reality and to stimulate reforming actions in our lives. What the book of Revelation does for us and what it's been doing for us in these past weeks is opening our eyes to the Christian worldview. 
And that worldview, very simply, is that the crucified, resurrected Jesus of Nazareth, who was in history, died in history, rose in history, is the one who now has ascended and reigns over all history and time and eternity. His people suffer on earth with joy while being threatened and seduced by the powers and the cultures of their day, whatever it is and wherever they are in the world. And yet what we also discover is that this God is in control at every point throughout the chaos of history and he has declared that he will come again and he will judge all of humanity and wind up history as we know it. And the call of revelation is for Christians to remain faithful to Jesus and the good news about him as we wait for his return to wind up history and bring us into his perfect presence forever. And so the challenge of revelation all the way through, on every occasion, as it is again today, live for the lamb, not for the beast. That's the challenge. Live for the bridegroom, not the prostitute. Eternal things, not temporal. To please God rather than anger him, for his eternal city rather than the lake of fire. That's the call right through Revelation as we have had right from the beginning and so now as we come to the end, we get to the final destination. That's where we're up to, the final destination. So I've got an outline for today's talk on the St Paul's app. It'd be good if you could go there. Also get your Bibles open. We're looking sort of across Revelation 17 to 19. Uh, You'll notice three points in the app, the prostitute and our problem, the lamb and our solution, and the bride and living for future hope. So first of all, and most of the time is on the prostitute and our problem. Uh, Chapters 17 and 18, we're introduced to a new figure in the storyline. It's a woman. She's mysterious, but her title uh, captures for us who she is. 17 verse 5. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. Now, it is possible for us to plunge into the extravagant imagery of these chapters to try and come up with an impressive display of convincing explanation of exactly who in history this woman is astride and who the garlic, the garlic, the scarlet beast is, as well as the seven heads, the seven hills, the seven kings, Babylon, and all the rest. What we need to do with the book of Revelation, I said right from the beginning, is to step back. Just step back and have a look. Notice, as you read through the text, the pride of, of this woman, her flashy appearance, her opposition to the disciples of Jesus, her allegiance to the beast and her fate. This woman represents the problem with the world. Twice in chapter 17, verse 8, we're told that the beast once was, now is, and yet will come. In other words, this beast manifests itself in one form, then it passes away, and then it will come back in other forms. That that is, this is just simply another one of the parodies of God that we've had right through, as we read in chapters 1, 4, and 11. In chapters 17, verses 10 and 12, the angel speaks of coming kings and transfers of power. In Daniel 7, in the Old Testament, the same language is used to describe successive kingdoms and empires. The symbolic numbers 7 and 10 in Revelation 17 don't refer to specific kings. Instead, John is highlighting the way that the beast manifests itself in power 
in reoccurring political empires and systems and societies throughout history. Even though the woman rides on the beast and rules over the kings in uh, 17 verse 7 and then again in verse 18, we see in verse 16 of chapter 17 that they turn on her and they destroy her. Such as the city of Rome itself. The all-powerful Rome, which is in the background here as John receives this revelation. Rome itself will be destroyed by the very empire it built in AD 410. What we see here is Babylon. In chapters 17 and 18, it represents human society without God. Human society with all its violence and oppression and corruption and injustice and rejection of God. And it's saying here, societies come and go. Kingdoms rise and they fall. And it will go on and on and on. And each one in its various forms will do exactly the same. Stand against God as ruler of all. See, what happens here with the book of Revelation is that the the major themes that are set up at the beginning of the Bible sort of all get intertwined and come to their conclusion at the end of the Bible. The threads all come together. The theme of Babylon and society against God is drawn to a close here as well as they celebrate in chapter 19, the end of Babylon. Babylon features in the Bible as early as Genesis chapter 10, verse 10. And it is likely linked to the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, the symbol of the godless society, proud society, in its attempt to storm the heavens, dethrone God, and take glory for themselves and make a name for themselves. Babel and Babylon are interchangeable. Throughout the Bible, Babylon came to stand for all that opposed God, all the empires and societies and peoples that oppose God. Daniel chapter 4, verse 30, is a great example where we have the egotistical Nebuchadnezzar declaring Is not this the great Babylon that I have built as my royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? All this sin of human society, all of its rejection of God the Creator is in chapter 19 verse 2 described as adultery prostitution all human sin is described as adultery prostitution against God and this too is one of the great themes of the Bible from beginning to end what we see in the Bible is that God doesn't relate to people primarily as a king to subjects or even as a shepherd to his sheep but as a husband to a wife God's plan from the beginning of creation was to have a solemn and a binding relationship with his people as binding and as comprehensive and as intimate as marriage. It's the kind of relationship with God that we were created for. No other religion dares talk about a relationship with God. Like like biblical Christianity. Human sin, therefore, is depicted as adultery. Sin is loving anything more than God. Sin is giving the title of our hearts to anything more than God. Sin is giving the center of our emotions and our imagination to anything apart from God. God doesn't just want us to rely upon Him like a shepherd He wants us to love him like a spouse. 
And sin is where we love anything more than God. So we need to grapple with this spiritual adultery. So imagine a married man who spends every evening over at the house of another woman and he talks about life with her, about his aspirations, his pains, his dreams. He shares life with this woman. In fact, he holidays, he takes long trips around the world with her. And finally, his wife confronts him about this other relationship. And he says, I really don't understand why you're getting so upset, frankly. You know, you've got my name, got my surname, I, you've got my money, I pay the bills, I cut the grass. I seriously do not understand what the problem is and why you're getting so worked up. The wife says, but I don't have your heart. Something else has your deepest affections of your heart. Now, most of us are sitting there and going, what sort of an idiot would say that? Well, who, would, who would ever say, what, what do you, what's the problem here? So here we go. Do you say you believe? Are you baptised? You go to church, you pray the Lord's Prayer, you work at obeying the Ten Commandments, and yet something else actually has the affections of your heart. There is something else that you are actually truly living for and has captured your imagination. It could be a career, it could be family, it could in fact be religion, it, it, it could be children, relationships, it could be a political cause, it could be your bank accounts, it could be a social cause. It is possible to give money to God our money. It's possible to give God our money and to take his name for ourselves and yet something else has the title over our hearts. Uh, for those who use social media, what do your posts and your likes reveal about what has captured your heart? Now, surely, as mere creatures, we don't expect our Creator to overlook this. Sin is spiritual adultery, which means it's more than just breaking the rules. Very important for us to grapple with that. It is so much more than just breaking the rules. It's walking all over the heart of our Creator. Sin breaks His heart. It destroys His relationship with Him. And unless we see human sin as a spiritual adultery, we will never grapple with the seriousness of it or the emotional devastation it actually is. It is so much more than breaking a rule. It is crushing a heart, the heart of the God who made us for himself. When we see this prostitute here, we see the fatal attraction of the human race. You see, it's one thing to be friends with someone. It's another thing to go to bed with them. That changes everything. And as James pointed out to us last week, Satan consistently parodies God. Evil consistently parodies good. The power and the affluence of society is seductive simply because it offers us what God offers us. We love money because it offers us what God offers us. You've got a guilty conscience. You've got enough money to buy the right lawyers. You can get yourself clean. It offers us what God offers us. Get really sick, get the right amount of money, you can get the best doctors to heal you. Even John, the apostle, the one who from the very beginning received the vivid vision of the glorified Lord Jesus standing amongst his church, the one who is said in John's gospel, the, the disciple who Jesus specifically loved, we are told here when he gets a vision of this prostitute riding the beast, he is mesmerized 
Verse 6, chapter 17, when I saw her, I was greatly astonished, attracted. And then the angel said to me, why are you astonished? The power and the glory of the human society is seductive. And even John needed the angel to grab him and slap him out of it. And so that's why it's crucial that we see in chapters 18 and 19 the end of Babylon. With all that it promises, it merely seduces you into destruction. Reading from verse 18, uh, 21 of chapter 18. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone, threw it into the sea, and said, With such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. Now, this is not rising and falling. This is never to be found again. This is the end. Of all the rises and fallings, this is the end. The music of harpists and musicians, pipers and trumpeters will never be heard in you again. No worker of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of a bridegroom and a bride will never be heard in you again. In other words, no continuing on in society, no joy, no celebration. Your merchants were the world's important people. The rich people were the important people. But your magic spell, by your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. The point is, it will come to naught. It promises so much and it delivers death and destruction. Revelation, this book, wakes us up to the fact that we are living with danger every single day and we cannot see it. And the point of Revelation is to help us see it. We are polishing the bomb every day of our life. And what this book tells us is the author of time itself had to be written into the very drama to help us to see it. And he's calling us to evacuate. Evacuate, evacuate Babylon. Do you see the seduction? For instance, take, here's an exercise, just this next week. In this coming week, Look at the advertising across various media platforms and engage with the message. Not just the pictures. Engage with the message and notice the seduction. They offer power, peace, status, paradise, performance, freedom, spirituality, comfort, enlightenment, friendship, life, reconciliation, identity, escape, balance and future. And that's just one week. And that's advertisements for coffee, cars, phones, holidays, cosmetics, and shoes. It's appalling. $10 billion a year is spent on advertising in this country alone with quasi-religious promises of meaning and fulfillment and hope in items that are created and can never produce it. It's all about what we worship. It's about what has captured our hearts. American pastor David Platt observes that North American Christians give 2.5% of their income to the local church and that local churches give 2% of their income to world mission. Now, we've got to bear in mind here that Revelation chapter 5, as we've already seen, is that mission to the nations is part of what it means to grapple with, grapple with the cross. It's part of what it means to come to Christ. And yet, every $100 that American Christians earn, they give five cents to global mission. Five cents. Surely that's got to be a good measure to the extent by which we are seduced by Babylon rather than being captured by a biblical worldview of the end of Babylon. Now, as you're aware, we've been heard about it this morning. We're seeking to raise $10,000 to support 
the Klentos family, our global mission partners in Africa, doing a very strategic ministry. And as of 7 a.m. this morning, I note that we've raised $5,584. Project finishes tomorrow. I think we've got some work to do this afternoon. Secondly, the lamb and our solution. Now, this prostitute in chapter 17 represents our biggest problem, that is spiritual adultery. Uh, We are given the solution to our biggest problem in the Lamb. Uh, The only thing that can turn us from spiritual adulterers, prostitutes, into a pure bride is the blood of Christ, the one whom Revelation has already declared earlier on as the Lamb of God. The Lamb is the only one who can cure us from our fatal attraction to Babylon. Now, the John who wrote this vision, this vision was given to, also is the John who wrote the Gospel of John. And so as we come to chapter 19, what is sitting in the background of Revelation 19 is John chapter 2 and the wedding at Cana in Galilee. Now, this is the wedding where they uh, run out of wine and... uh, Mary comes to Jesus and says, you might want to do something about that. Uh, Now, this is crucial. These are are wedding feasts that go on for days, and wine was essential part of that celebration, the joy of the celebration. And all of a sudden, they've run out of wine. It's a social crisis in the first century. And Mary comes to Jesus and says, uh, verse 3, chapter 2, they have no more wine. Woman, Jesus says, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. So crisis time, no wine at the wedding. And Mary comes and says, Jesus, no wine. And Jesus' reply is, I'm not ready to die. That's what he says. Because every time he refers to this hour or his hour in John's gospel is a reference to the cross, his death on the cross. And so he says to Mary, I'm not yet ready to die. And Mary's like, you know, what's that got to do with it? You know, like, we just need wine. Uh, you know, Jesus, go to your room. Um, what, what, I mean... What is going on here at the wedding of Cana? Well, throughout the Old Testament, especially in places like Isaiah 62, Ezekiel 16, Jeremiah 2, God reveals himself to be the bridegroom of his people. And then in Matthew chapter 9, the Pharisees come along to Jesus and they complain to him about his disciples because they're so loose with the Jewish rituals and practices. And in verse 15 of Matthew 9, Jesus says this to them. How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them and then they will fast. See what he's saying there? He said, I am the bridegroom. I am the bridegroom. I am God. I'm the Lord of my people. So in John chapter 2, he's saying at the wedding of Canaan, he's saying, Mother, you are right. There is no joy at a wedding without the wine. It's part of the celebration. And if my people, if my bride is going to fall into my arms with joy, then I'm going to have to die. The bridegroom is going to have to die for the bride. And so on the night that he was betrayed, he took the cup of wine and he says, this represents my blood. This represents my blood. We have no joy, we have no hope of a marriage feast with God forever unless his blood is shed for the punishment of our sin. He drinks the cup of God's righteous anger and and justice uh, that we deserve for our adultery. 
That's the cup he had to drink for us. And the only way that we will ever participate in a wedding feast of joy forever with Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, is that he has to go to the cross in history and to take up the cup of justice and anger from God. He had to drink the cup of God's wrath in history so that we could drink the cup of joy for all eternity. And that's why we have the victory cry. That's why we have this roar of triumph from heaven in verse, chapter 19, verse 6. Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her, given her to wear. His blood is shed and our sins are wiped clean, pure as white as snow. And his offer of forgiveness of sins is simply that. It is free. We didn't achieve it. We didn't launder our own sins. He did it all. Our filthy rags of sin and righteousness have been swapped by bright, clean clothes of linen made clean by Jesus. The lamb... The Lamb is our only solution. And this brings me to the final image that we have here. For all who put their trust in the Lamb are the bride. Now, there might be a few blokes here who are struggling with the idea of being a bride of Christ. You know, it's like it's messing with your masculinity or something like that. Uh, Then again, Galatians chapter 4 says that all of us are sons of God. And so, you know, in the end, we've all got some adjustments to make. So let's just bear with it on this one. It changes a lot when you realize that you are in a marital union with God and not just simply a king-subject or shepherd-sheep relationship. Firstly, it means that you have a legal relationship. In every culture around the globe, if you are poor, but you marry someone rich, you become rich. Although we are all spiritual adulterers, when we come to Jesus by faith and accept his death on our behalf, his perfect righteousness becomes ours. He doesn't just cancel our debt against God and bring us back up to square zero. His pure record of righteousness becomes ours. All of it is ours. And if you are a Christian, that is you now. That is your status before God now. Secondly, being Jesus' bride means that we're in a comprehensive relationship. Marriage impacts every area of your life, everything. There is no such thing as his and hers. You cannot compartmentalize it in just a couple of parts. The marriage refers just to the bed, but, you know, not to my hobbies, for instance. The vows are very clear in the marriage ceremony. With all that I am and all that I have, I honor you. The word all, all is comprehensive, as it always is. So a relationship with Jesus touches every aspect of your life. Thirdly, it's an intimate relationship. Relationship with Jesus requires contact. It's the love of Christ poured into our hearts and our hearts being poured out to him. And so I want to keep asking you this as we've done several times. What is your devotional life like right now? Does it exist? Is it just a matter of read the Bible, keep the devil away kind of thing? A chapter a day keeps the devil away? Or is it, you know, what is it? Is it yeah, you're pursuing actual intimacy with your lover? Could your devotional life be described as intimate right now? Fourthly, our relationship with Jesus is to be fruitful. When we put our lives in Jesus' hands, we bear fruit. It's one of the absolute certainties. When we put our lives in his hands, we bear fruit. And fruit is the outward working of an inner life. That is, when Jesus' love pours into my heart, it transforms who I am. 
It transforms my priorities, my life, my attitudes from the inside out. So in such a way that I pursue Jesus' priorities and I pursue his character. Lastly, this relationship with Jesus is comforting. At the wedding feast in Cana, which is obvious now to us, in John chapter 2, Jesus sat amongst the joy of this wedding feast and it was pretty obvious that he was pondering his coming sorrow on the cross. That's obvious. But because he went to the cross, we can now sit amongst all the sorrow of this world with all the chaos and the carnage and the sin and the injustice of this world and we can ponder the coming joy of the wedding banquet in his presence. It's comforting. So friends, whether you've got a good marriage, a bad marriage, you've got no marriage but want a marriage, or you've had a marriage but not anymore, whatever your status, that covers everyone here basically, whatever your status, there is only one spouse that can give you the joy and the fulfilment that you need. Babylon cannot provide it for you. Only Jesus Christ. And this is what awaits all those who accept the invitation to the feast. And this invitation is your invitation. Every single person who hears these words. Chapter 19, verse 9. Then the angel said to me, Write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And that is your invitation right there, right now. It's like John getting out and he's, he's writing the wedding invitations and dispersing it to all of humanity. The invitation is there. Come to Jesus, experience his love, his acceptance, his relationship, and his eternal joy. Believe in Jesus. Trust in the work of the cross that he's done for you. Do it today. Get connected with us online. Send us an email. Speak to one of the staff or a friend who's brought you here today. In chapter 18, John calls us to leave Babylon. It's not a call to a new geographical location like, hey, you know, let's leave Sydney and move to Orange. He's not, he's not talking about that. It's an ideological shift is what he's calling us to. He's calling us to adopt a different set of values, a different set of priorities, a different allegiance, a different object of worship. He is calling us to be citizens of the wedding feast of the Lamb. The message of Revelation is that that is the only alternative to the fate of Babylon. The city of God. It is a call here to a new city, a different city, a city where there's no pain, no loss, where there is just gain and joy increasing forever, which is what you were made for. But I'm getting ahead of myself because we're going to talk more about that city next week. What a spoiler for Steve to drop to prepare us for next week. I can't wait for that as well. Revelation 19 says, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality. At the heart of the Christian life is active trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrificial death for our sin, and the turning away from the things that tempt and seduce us. Uh, as Christians have done for centuries, 20 centuries, we're going to partake in the Lord's Supper, where we eat and drink, reminding ourselves what God has done. And in this symbolic meal, originating from Jesus' Last Supper with his disciples, we express and strengthen our trust in him, as we eat and drink with our brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord's Supper is an outward and visible sign of the grace shown to us in the death and resurrection of our Saviour.
as we share bread and juice together, we are invited to feed on Him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We are faced again with God's love for the unworthy and are strengthened by faith in the one whose body was given and whose blood was shed for us. So come then with heartfelt repentance and genuine trust in the Lord, recognizing the significance of sharing in this way. Uh, Now, if in good conscience it would not be right for you to participate, uh, please use this time. Instead of taking the the, the juice and the bread, just ask them to, to leave that and spend a moment reflecting on God's love for you in Christ. But knowing the goodness of God... And the times we have failed to, to respond with love and obedience. Let's confess our sins together with the confession on the screen. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have often gone our own way and rejected your will for our lives. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, Forgive us, cleanse us, and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you in every way. For the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our God is slow to anger and full of compassion. He forgives all who humbly repent and turn to his Son, Jesus Christ, in whom there is no condemnation. Amen. Uh, On the night before Jesus died, he took bread... Uh, And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, he took the cup and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of my new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for these gifts of your creation and pray that we who eat and drink them in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, believing our Saviour's word, may be partakers of his body and blood. Amen. So uh, our our welcomers are going to come and hand out the elements now. Uh, Please take the juice and the wafer and hang on to those. Uh, If you are uh, joining us online, take a moment to go and grab the juice and the bread that you have at home if you have them. Uh, And as we uh, take these, spend a moment reflecting on all the goodness that comes from being the bride of Christ.
Brothers and sisters, take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. And drink this, remembering that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Amen. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and have brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace, and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us in this hope that we have grasped, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Amen. Let's do that thing right now. Let's praise his name. Let's stand and worship our God together. today as the bride. Don't forget, this afternoon, 5 p.m., come and learn about fasting and spend time praying for where God is taking us as a church. And we are in the last days to give for Darian and Vanessa Klensos in South Africa. 
Steve uh, has reminded us from Revelation that marriage changes everything. And God calls us to be His bride. And when we are, we are His and He is ours. We can bear fruit, we can be comforted, and we can have intimacy, we can know Him. Let's pursue that this week. Amen.